you, Dr. It's really a pleasure um, to present this information before you. Um, I am so excited um, and honored to be here. And I just want to thank all of the ladies who came before me and spoke and prayed and everything that you've done so far. Ashley, you have done an amazing job with this conference. And I truly believe that God will get the glory out of this. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get started. And I'm really going to try my best to get through this information. I am like you, Ashley, or Dr. Ashley. I am huge on the education piece. So I am an educator, and I will explain and explain to make sure that you understand what I'm trying to convey. And so forgive me. I, I don't want to go past the time. So I'm going to look at the time now, and we'll just get started. And so overall, I know that today's topic is going to be about money, right? And money is a touchy subject for a lot of people. But can I just tell you that uh, the Bible, in the Bible, the subject of, of money is taught about or talked about over 800 times. It's one of the most and the highest, really, subject in the Bible is money. And so, that, so today we're going to talk about handling God's money in God's way. And there was a scripture here and it says, you know, to be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so I know Dr. Ashley, you wanted me to uh, speak a little bit about myself. And so as coach Ashley mentioned, I am a finance coach. I'm a wife. I'm a, I'm an author. I'm a minister. And I'm truly just a worker um, of God's will, right? And so I've been in business and I have another business called The Greater In You where I'm a life coach. And I've been doing that since 2016. I truly believe that God has placed something in each and every one of us. And I know that for me personally, I had to spend some time really getting before God to figure out what is my thing, God? What should I be doing? What can I do to edify the body of Christ? And so it was during that time that God really revealed to me my business and, and really helped me to really hone in on my gifts and my talents. I truly believe uh, that when the Bible talks about our gifts and our talents will make room for us. When it comes to the financial portion for me, I did not see how that fit into the mix, okay? <laughs> and so you'll hear a little bit about my story and I'll keep it short uh, for the sake of time. But for me, I never thought that God would use me in the area of personal finances because I was one who had accumulated a ton of debt, didn't know anything about money, didn't really care to know. But then when I got to the place where I wanted to know more about it, I didn't have the money, okay? And so it was crazy how God worked that thing around. But I, I am truly grateful and thankful for the place that God has me in right now. And so I'm just going to go ahead and get started, okay? And so let's, give me one second. All right, there we go. And so the purpose of this presentation today is one, to start a conversation about money, right? And I know I kind of talked about that in the, in the beginning, but I do know that a lot of um, the issue of finances or personal finances, it starts in the mindset, right? And so in this presentation, you won't see a lot of statistics per se, but let me just give you one astounding statistic, all right? In the African-American community, so there was a report that was published back in 2007, and it's called The Road to Zero. And in that report, it basically states that as the African-American community, we are 228 years behind our white counterparts when it comes to creating and establishing wealth. And so I just want you to sit with that for a minute, okay? Because that means that there is some work that needs to be done. And I think that for every woman that came on here and talked about their specific topic, one thing that we know is that we have to not only get wisdom, but we have to get an understanding. We have to get an understanding of things that one, are not going to be taught to us in school, right? So education will never stop in a formal setting. We have to branch out and seek out the information that's going to take us to the next level, all right? And so we're, I'm going to introduce some of the secrets of the wealthy that are not shared with us. And, and, and then we're going to talk about this financial needs analysis. And this is the only time I'm going to mention this. But ultimately, everything that I'm talking about today can be accomplished through something that I call the financial needs analysis. And what that's going to do, that's going to help you to plan your legacy. That's going to help you to eliminate debt help you with budgeting and knowing how to invest your money properly, which I believe is something that we definitely need to do. All right. 
So they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Here we have somebody sitting on a stool and he has a chain around his head with a lock. But I want you to see in the distance, there's a key and the door is open, but yet he is sitting on that stool. That really speaks to the, to the heart of where we are financially. So we have the information readily available. You know, we have Google, we have YouTube, we have all these things, yet we are not seeking out the information that we need to get us free. So freedom is right there. And we see so many people in the distance who fought for freedom, right? But yet we are still locked in the cage with the key. <laughs> we have the keys. And so I want you guys to be encouraged and know and listen, we can do all things through Christ that gives us the strength, right? And God has truly strengthened us and given us the tools and the resources to live the abundant life. But we just got to pick up the key, right? And we just got to put it in the lock and turn it and walk through the door. The door is already open. And so we just got to walk through the door, okay? <clears throat> and so let's talk about some guiding principles. One, God owns it all, right? We are called to be stewards of, over what he has given us temporarily in earth, right? We can't take anything with us, but we can leave it as an inheritance for our children and our children's children. God is the source of our blessings, right? It's not us. <laughs> it is God that is blessing us with these things, right? And I talked about the stewardship part. God honors our obedience. The Bible says that obedience is better than sacrifice. And so we want to be obedient to the things of God and really looking in scripture when it comes to money and, and seeing what is God saying about money, right? And so either we're going to receive the whole word of God or we're not, right? And so there's something in there about money and God expects us to give cheerfully, all right? And so I want you guys to think on this. Your confidence is in direct proportion to your competence. And so the more you know, the more you can do, right? I know people say that knowledge is power, but it doesn't become powerful until you actually apply it. And it's just like scripture, right? You can read the word, you can go to church every single day, but it doesn't make you saved, right? You got to apply the stuff that you're learning so that now you can experience these things that the Bible promises, that God promises us. And so I want you to ponder on this. And I love this. I've been reading this book, Rich Dad, Poor, Do Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And it, it was written back in 2002. But one of the things that really stuck out to me was this. One of the reasons the rich get richer and the poor get poorer and the middle class struggles in debt is because the subject of money is not taught at home. It, I mean, it's not taught at home. It's not taught in school. It's taught at home, all right? And But it's being taught at home by parents who don't have any money. And so when I ask people, you know, what was your education like when you were coming up, you know, as far as finances, most people were not taught about finances when they were growing up because their parents didn't have any money. But for those who are wealthy, trust and believe, they're teaching their kids how to buy businesses, not work in them. They're teaching their kids how to own property, right? Not rent property. And so that's where we got to get into the understanding of, of how money works. And so one topic I want to talk to you about is becoming an owner and not a loner and truly bypassing the middleman, all right? And so there are three accounts that you need to have set up if you truly want to have your basis covered. The first is the emergency fund. And with the emergency fund, that's about three to six months worth of living expenses in the event that something happens. You lose a job, a pandemic hits, and you can still live, right? And your family doesn't have to suffer. Short-term savings, right? So if you want to go and buy a home and have a down payment on that home, if you want to purchase a car, right? That's where you have the short-term savings and that's money that you would actually invest for a short term. And then lastly, uh, it would be the long-term savings and investments. And so I can tell you that people work for 40 years, but they don't often think about how much money do I actually need to retire, right? And I want to retire with dignity and if, if we look at the numbers, if I were to pull up the numbers today, one thing I know is that most people are not retiring with dignity. They haven't saved enough money. And it's not because they didn't have a desire to do it. It's not because they didn't want to do it, but it's because they didn't have a plan. 
They didn't have a plan for where they wanted to go. And I truly believe that success is not an accident. You have to plan for what you want to take place, right? But at the end of the day, we are going to trust the Lord with all of our heart and lean not to our own understandings, right? In all of our ways, we are going to acknowledge him and he will direct our paths. So even though we may have all of these things set up, we still have to put our trust and our confidence in God because anything could happen with the economy. Anything could happen with our money, but God, right? But God, God has provided for us since the beginning. <laughs> and so we have to continue to have our trust in God and believing that he's gonna move on our finances, right? And so let's talk about this subject on becoming an owner and not a loner. So I wanna talk to you ladies about how money actually works when you put it in the bank. And so let me just tell you this, Savings institutions or banks, for example, if you were to have your money sitting in a savings account, they would only give you about 0.04% interest return on your money. So that's basically zero, right? And so when you put your money in the bank, what the bank does is they now lend that money out to different people, some people with marginal credit, some people with perfect credit. And for those who have perfect credit, they're not really making any money off of them, but they're making money off of those who are desperate and they just need it. And they are willing to accept the double digit interest they have to pay back to the bank, all right? And so now the other thing they do with that money that you deposit into the account is that they now invest that in the global economy, all right? And so where the bank may be getting 12%, 20%, they're only giving us 0.04%, which is zero, all right? So just something to keep in mind, we are literally funding the banks, right? And some of us, we are establishing a legacy, but it's not for our families, it's for the bank. And so that's something to keep in mind when you think about long-term savings, you don't wanna necessarily have hundreds of thousands of dollars, not even $20,000, sitting just sitting in the bank because it's never going to grow there okay and so let's keep going i want to talk to you ladies about the rule of 72 and i love sharing this rule because normally when i ask people um have you ever heard of it they say no what is it right and this is one of the secrets of the wealthy that we do not learn in school okay <laughs> And so what the rule of 72 states is whatever interest rate you are earning, you take that number, you divide it into 72, and that's how many years it's going to take for your money to double, all right? So I'm going to show you an example of what that looks like. And just, and, and just for example purposes, I know I said that when you put your money in a savings account at the bank, they give you 0.04% interest return on your money. And so if I, if I asked everybody to unmute and I said, you know, what is zero divided by 72? You're all going to say zero. <laughs> and so that means that there is no, there is no return. Okay. And so let me give you an example right here. So let's say I got $10,000 or you received $10,000. And the only stipulation was you needed to leave that money invested for 48 years before you could touch it. All right. So $10,000 and you have a 3% interest rate, three divided by 72 is 24. So now every 24 years, your money is going to double and it's going to go from 10 to 20,000, 20,000 to 40,000 in 48 years. Now, I don't even have to ask you to unmute to, to know that we all know that $40,000 is not enough for retirement. Nobody can retire with $40,000 and live the life that they envision for themselves, right? People make $40,000 a year and still are living paycheck to paycheck. So it's just not enough money. And so now if we doubled that and we went to 6%, six divided into 72 is now 12. Every 12 years, my money is doubling. And so it's gonna grow from 10,000 to $160,000. But as the previous speaker just talked about, right, if I am having health issues and I'm 68 years old, how long is 160,000 going to last if I'm constantly going to the hospital every other day? And, and perhaps there are some things that the insurance company does not cover. And so now I have to make a decision. Either I'm going to uh, get the help I need or I'm not going to get it, right? So 160,000 uh, doesn't go far, right? And so let's look at 12%. And so banks on average, 
if they were to go ahead and invest money out into the global economy, they may be earning 12%, 20%, 30%. And if banks were being generous, let's say, for example, they gave us 3% interest if they were being generous, right? Well, the bank earned 12% on my money. And so now 12 divided into 72 is now six. Every six years, the money is doubling. And so that 10,000 grew to 2.5 million. But if the bank was being generous and they gave me 3%, I ended up with 40,000. So where did the rest of the 2.5 million go? It didn't go to me. It went to the banks, right? And so let me just tell you guys that mutual funds on average have a rate of return of 12%. And so for most of us, just like me, I had no idea what a mutual fund is. Now, because I'm investment licensed, I know how to invest money, but I had no idea. So I'm just like everybody else, just like, you know, hey, it doesn't matter. But we want to, we don't want to work every day for all the money that we receive. In other words, there's going to come a time where we would no longer be able to trade hours for dollars. We need our money to grow hard, well, to grow and, and work hard for us versus us working hard for our money. And if you look at somebody that's wealthy, I can guarantee you they are not punching anybody's clock. And most of their, their ventures, they're not even grossly involved in it, right? They literally have businesses, right, that are operating without them. And so we need our money to work hard for us because, listen, the educators, they refuse to teach us about money in school. And I'm going to tell you that I went to college, I got an MBA, and I did not learn any of this. And I'm looking at them like, really? Like, I, I, I spent a lot of money on school, but they didn't teach me any of this. And this would have been how life-changing would this have been had you known this 10 years ago or 15 years ago, right? And so it's important that we take advantage of that. And so with the compounding interest, and this is an another example, if I were to save $200 a month for 37 years, age 30 to 67, 3% interest, I earn about 162,000. But look at the 6% interest, right? 327,000 just with 9% interest, 714,000. So the power of earning a higher interest rate is so critical because there's one thing that we can't get back and that's time. Your money needs time to mature. Your money needs time to grow, okay? And so let's keep it moving, let's keep it moving. And so, and I'm sorry, I can't see some of this stuff up here because this is in my way. Give me one second. <laughs> All right. And so when you buy on a credit card and only make the minimum payment, your new balance is principal plus interest. And that amount gets compounded month after month, right? So there is a way that compounding interest can work against you if you're not paying off your debt faster, right? And I don't believe there's anyone that, that said when they were a child, you know, when I grow up, I want to be indebted to somebody, when I grow up, I want to be poor. Nobody is saying that. We all want to be financially independent. We all want to have something, right? And so let's keep it going. So this is a verse I want you guys to keep in mind. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, right? So everything belongs to God. Everything belongs to God, okay? And so let's, uh, let's talk about this, God as a provider. He provided a garden, right? He provided a garden. He provided a place for man in the garden. And he gave parameters. It's the same thing with our money, right? There's a way we have to respect the money that we get in our lives. We can't just be all willy-nilly and just, you know, going on shopping sprees and we know we didn't pay our bills. It just don't work like that, right? But a lot of people think it does work like that. See, God is not an ATM. Right. And so we may get this money and then we spend it frivolously and then we pray and ask God to bless our finances and to help us, you know, to pay the light bill or something like that. But what we really need is stewardship. What we really need is discipline. Right. We got to get more discipline so that we can have the things that we want to have. And that goes beyond money. That goes. I mean, that's everything in life. We have to get that discipline together. And so here is another thing. We are stewards, right? We are managers. 
If I'm managing something, that means what? It's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a manager, right? Stewardship, right? Time, talent, and treasure. God created us from nothing. He created us in his image. We are dependent on God and God, he created us to do good works, right? And so here it is, take control, take control. Matthew 6 and 24 says, no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despite the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, mammon, money, right? You can't serve both. So we have to know our purpose and what are we, why are we taking control of our finances? And so of all the threats to your financial security, none is more dangerous than debt. And the reason being is because when you are in debt, your money is already counted for. It's already accounted for, right? And so if you look at your debt to income ratio and your debt to in income ratio was really high, that means that you have more money going out the door to debt and you're keeping less money, right? And so if I'm consistently getting into these huge pur purchases, paying double digit interest, I'm going, I'm keeping, I'm, you know, I'm doing all these different things, I'm assuming that I'm going to be alive to pay these things. I'm assuming that I'm going to be alive, you know, to take care of these obligations I have. And it's not to say that God is not saying, okay, go ahead and do that. But I believe that he would give you a strategy and a plan to do whatever it is that you're needing to do, right? So we definitely need to use wisdom and all of our money choices. And so is, is, your, debt, is your debt so high you can't save? Right. And that's the whole purpose of getting out of debt sooner so that you can start saving money, because eventually you won't be able to work the way you work today for your money. Right. And so do you use your credit cards to pay your bills, carrying a revolving balance each month, missing a payment? Now you got the late fee going on. Now you got overdraft fees. You got all this stuff compounding. And now you want to get to the cash side but you're consistently finding yourself on a debt cycle, right? Your finances are controlling you, but you're not controlling your finances. And so we got to get control of our money. See, our money is the one thing that, that, that does not come with an instruction manual. And so we have to direct our money, right? Because the Bible says that money answers all things. <laughs> and so if you don't give your money an assignment, it's going wherever it wants to go. And then you'll look at your check and it's like, man, I just got paid. What happened to all my money? It's like, you know, you bought your money home in, in, in a bag and it had holes in it. And now the part that you bought home, God blew on that. Why? Because you didn't have any plans in place. And so you didn't give it a direction. And so it just went in every direction because listen, we got to be control. We, we have to have control over this thing. God gave us dominion. So we have to take dominion over our finances. Ashley, how much time do I have? I don't even know. I am just flowing and going. <laughs> you're you're good on time. You're actually, you have extra time, so you're good. Oh, perfect. I think I'll be able to get through with it. I, I hope I'm not boring you guys. I, I told you education, that's, that's my thing. So I like to just, you know. <laughs> so listen, I want to give you guys some practical tips on eliminating debt, okay? Identify your needs versus your wants. What do you actually need versus what do you want? And listen, it's not to say that you can never have it, but there is a time and a season for everything. And so it may not be time for you to, you know, get your daily Amazon packages. It might be time for you to pay down this $300 credit card that you didn't have for three years. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it's a time and a season and a space for everything. So we have to identify, do I actually need this? And then you want to take that 24 hours. Definitely if it's something that's a larger purchase that you know, like that Louis Vuitton bag or whatever it is that you guys are into, think about that. Now, if I buy this, am I going to be able to pay the mortgage or am I dependent on my next check? So now we live in paycheck to paycheck to pay this bill. Now, what happens if you get sick and you're an hourly worker, you don't have any sick time accumulated? You're just not going to get paid. And so now the cycle continues. And it's not to say that we can't have these things, but we have to put that thing in perspective and start tracking these things and planning at one, right? If there's a sale today, trust me, there will be another sale, period. 
all right? <laughs> Eliminate shopping as a hobby. Listen, if you are in debt, you cannot go shopping as a hobby. You owe, that's somebody else's money you're spending, <laughs> okay? And so take care of business first. Then we can wild out a little bit. Then we can start spending some money, right? But we take care of business first, okay? Track your spending. Let me go back. Track your spending. Your spending because if you don't know where your money is going, then it'll be just like what I described, right? You got to track. And, and, and actually finding out, do you actually have enough money for the bills? Oftentimes people find that it's like, you know, and so in like in, in and of yourself, you're wanting to live, but yet your money, the money that you have coming in and your expenses are like this. There is no, like, there's no playroom. And so sometimes that means eliminating certain unnecessary things that you don't need on a daily basis like cable, right? Maybe it would be Netflix and Hulu instead of cable because some of these cable bills like $150 a month, right? Some of these unnecessary purchases that we don't necessarily need so that we can attack our debt for a season and then potentially go back to that stuff later if it even makes sense, okay? And so another memory verse, Philippians 4 and 12, I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Listen, I know how to struggle, right? I know how to, I know how to have money. I know how to be here. And I know how to be there. But wherever I find myself, I'm going to be content, right? Because it all belongs to God. See, it's not all about the money. It's not all about the fame. It's not all about all these things. I want to make it into the kingdom, period. And I don't want money, right, to be that thing that I'm constantly chasing because the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you, right? And so it's not about chasing money, but we want to have a good name in the earth, right? And so if we owe somebody, we want to make sure we pay that thing, right? Because the Bible says, oh, no man, nothing um, but to love him. And so complete and total dependence, this is contentment. Complete and total dependence on God and his provisions for your life, independent of external conditions and circumstances. So no matter what, whether I have all the money in the world, whether I don't, I'm still going to trust God. I'm still going to have my confidence in God. I know that he can do it, but if he hasn't done it, then guess what? I still love God, right? I'm still, I'm still excited to praise and worship him, right? Because he is God. Yes, he said that I can have an abundant life, right, at the end of the day, but what is abundance? Abundance is not just about money. Abundance is not just about one single thing. It's a mindset, right? And so satisfaction, those are some synonyms, um, synonyms. thankfulness, humility, and the exact opposite of that would be selfishness, greed, lust, right? Attitudes, actions, and behavior centered on self, not others in God, right? So we know that it's about advancing the kingdom by any means necessary, but I truly believe that money is a tool. And so for people who are good and they want to advance the kingdom, money is just going to give them more resources. It's going to make them better, right? But for other people who don't have that, that right motive, money is just going to make them more evil, right? And so money is not the, <laughs> money is not the issue, it's how we use the money, all right? And I'm going to be wrapping up in a second here. And so how compound interest can work against you. We saw about how compounding interest can work for you, but again, on the opposite side of that, it can work against you. And so let me just say, uh, I meet with a lot of people on a, on, on a daily basis, black, white, Latino, you name it. And one thing I'm finding is that our, our minorities, right, we get trapped into a lot of credit card debt. And it's not that, just because we're minorities, but, and it's, the debt will last for years and years. I'm talking about a $300 balance, a $500 balance, because the interest is so high, we get comfortable paying the minimum, right? And so when you buy on a credit card and only make minimum payments, your new balance is principal plus interest. And, and, and listen, 
If you're not really attacking the principal, all you're paying is interest. And don't miss a payment. Good God almighty, now you're really messed up, right? Now your card is over the limit. And don't use the card. So now I'm using the card and now I'm back in the same boat, right? And so for credit cards, it really should only be used in about 30% of the available balance on those cards. I know it's tempting to use more, but when you have those three accounts set up, that emergency fund, in the event of an emergency, you already have that money set aside. You don't have to put it on a credit card, right? If you want to go ahead and do like a major purchase in a, in a few years, you don't necessarily have to put it on a credit card when you plan for where you want to go, all right? And so instead of your savings growing, your debt is actually growing. So we want to get away from that. And so I want to show you an example of debt stacking. So debt stacking identifies the ideal order of your payoffs of your debts. And that's something that can be accomplished in the financial needs analysis, which I do for free, by the way. That's something that can be accomplished in that plan. So I want to show you what that looks like in action. So say, for example, I have someone, they're age 35, and they have this type of debt, you know, a Macy's card, a Capital One card, car loan, uh, American Express, and a mortgage. And their total bills every month are about $27.20 towards their debt. And so what debt stacking does is, Instead of me just paying the minimums on everything, once I eliminate a debt, I'm going to take that dollar amount and I'm going to roll it down to the next debt on the list that was established in the financial needs analysis, okay? And so I'm going to continue doing that until my debt is eliminated, right? And if you guys are following this, you'll see that now I'm paying higher payments, but it's still the same dollar amount. And so ultimately, I'm going to get out of debt a lot faster. And as a matter of fact, if I did not follow this plan, and as you can see, I'm paying the same amount of money every month, I would be out of debt nine years sooner. But if I did it, it would take me 23 years to get out of debt. That's the discipline that I'm talking about, okay? And so for most people, if I would ask them, you know, depending on their mindset, for some people, let me say some people, if I ask them, if you had a free $220 a month, for example, and you eliminated your Macy's card, what would you do with that money? Some people would say, man, I would celebrate. You know, I'm going to Ruth Chris, I'm going to get a steak, a lobster. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to celebrate. They don't often say, I'm going to take that money and put it on the next bill, on the next debt. That's discipline. It takes discipline because you've already gotten accustomed to paying 2720 and you just want a break. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I used to be the same way. I totally understand, right? But when you look at the plan and you see that you can be out of debt 14 years sooner, if you follow the plan with the same money, come on now. <laughs> come on. Come on now, right? And so look at this. Not only are you going to avoid, let me sit here. 23 years to pay off debt and you pay $214,000 in interest, right? But you're going to save $130,000 in interest if you follow the plan, right? You're out of debt sooner. That's literally a house. Like you can buy your house cash with that, all right? $130,000. And so once your debt is paid off down in here, you invest that $27,20 a month. Why? Because you've gotten accustomed to paying it off already, and then you invested that at 9% interest at retirement age, you would have 60, you would have $2.4 million. $2.4 million, okay? <laughs> or you can make the minimum payments and don't have any money saved. So if I would ask you, if you had your choice, would you rather have the 2.4 million or if you would rather just pay all the minimums, I'm pretty sure you would say, Alex, I'll take the 2.4 million. <laughs> Why would I not want that money? It's gonna take some work, right? It's gonna take some discipline. And so we gotta make sure that we are following that. And so let me show you this. Debt stacking can lead to debt freedom, right? Debt freedom. Can you just imagine? And I know some of you on the line, you're probably debt-free already. So this is probably just like, oh, it's a snooze fest, right? But let me just tell you, right? When you are debt-free, you have more freedom and more options available to you. And so getting out of debt sooner, and we just actually went through this example 
why would I pay 214,000 in interest when I could only pay 83,000? I would rather pay less than to pay more, right? And so this is the, I think this is one of the last concepts, buying the right kind of life insurance. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. That's Proverbs 13 and 22. Listen, there's a lot of different types of life insurance out there and we're not gonna get into that right now, but I just wanna uh, open up your mindset about life insurance, okay? And so how much is your car worth, right? Would you insure your car? Absolutely, you would, because you know that if something happens, you want to only pay the deductible. You don't want to have to buy a whole new car if something happens to your car. How much is your house worth, right? Would you insure your house? Oh, yes. I'm going to insure my house because I need some place to live. But I want to ask you, how much is your life worth, right? You can't replace your life. Your family can't replace you, right? And so, we know that your life is worth a lot more than a car or house or any other asset, right? But we have to make sure that we are doing what it takes to protect and insure our lives, right? So you can't afford not to insure your life. I think everybody would agree with that. So I'm going to give you some examples on bank A and bank B, all right? And so let me show you that bank A, right? no money. And so this is about different kinds of life insurance. And I want to see which one would you choose. And I know that you can't unmute, but I'm pretty sure you're going to choose one of these banks. And I'll tell you which one in a second. All right. And so for the first bank, bank A, there is no money for one to four years, right? They give you 1% to 4% return on your money after the one to four years has gone past, right? five to 8% interest to get your money. So you can borrow against this policy, but yet when you pay it back, you're gonna pay back five to 8% interest. That's a little lopsided already, all right? And then at the end, when you die, they keep your savings, all right? The opposite side of that, bank B, your money is credited to you now. You have the potential for a 6 to 12% return on your money, okay? No fee to withdraw your money. And your family gets your savings when you die. And so if you had your choice, I'm pretty sure you would pick bank B. So let me just give you a little bit of background about life insurance. I'm going to be wrapping up. And so back in the day, the African-American community, we were only allowed and permitted by law to get $1,000 in life insurance. The reason being is because life insurance was considered a transfer of wealth. And it is a transfer of wealth, $1,000. What can you do with $1,000 today? You definitely can't bury anybody. You can't send anybody to school and you can't even pay somebody's bills for a month with $1,000. There's nothing you can do. So that's all we can do. Of course, the money was different back in the day, but $1,000 because it was a transfer of wealth. They didn't want us to have it. But now, when I know that in the previous slide, I said, you know, how much is your life worth? Do you know that people would much rather pay for an insurance policy on their phone than to insure their lives and make sure their family is properly protected in the event that something happens to them, right? And so there's a lot that I can say about life insurance, but I can tell you that the ultimate goal is for your family to be protected while you are on, on the journey of establishing wealth, okay? So let me just show you something here. This is how money works. And so in the early years, you need a lot of coverage, potentially because you have a house mortgage, right? You have high debt, you have young children. So the loss of income will be devastating to your family. And the one thing they cannot replace is you, but they can't replace the money that you bring in. And so if you're in a family that depends on each other's income, then that income loss is devastation. And now you're trying to figure out, okay, can we stay in this house? Do we need to give the car back? And now you're grieving, but yet you still need to take care of these last final wishes and continue to live, right? 
And so in the earlier years, you may not have a lot of money. And so you would get a term life insurance policy that would take care of you while you're establishing wealth. But in the later years, it says you better have money because you can't always work and trade hours for dollars. You may not be able to work the way you work right now. And so at retirement, your kids are grown, your debt should be lower or eliminated, your mortgage should be paid, and you need retirement income. I can't tell you how many people I've sat down with who actually retired and they had to go right back to work. They, I, I promise you, they never imagined that their life would end up like that. And I'm telling you that I've met with people who have poured so much into their children. They sent them to college. They've done all these things. The kids didn't, go, didn't do anything with the degrees. And no, 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 no diss to college because I went to college too. Kids didn't do nothing with the degrees. They don't take care of the parents. And now the parents are struggling to make ends meet and they're too old to work and they're sick. That's devastation, right? And so, yes, we want to make sure that we provide everything that we need for our children, but we got to remember ourselves too, right? So we got to make sure that we're putting something aside for ourselves in the future. And so with any good financial program, it always starts with life insurance because that is what is, that's income protection. Everything else that goes up here is based on your income. You can't do any of this without money, right? And so now you have the emergency fund and now you accelerate your debts with the debt stacking, six months of income saved in your emergency fund, your retirement, long-term uh, savings, college funds, if you wanted to send your kids to college and now your other goals and dreams are up there. But oftentimes we flip this and it's upside down, right? And so we start at the top of the ladder and we're like, okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and live my best life and I'm gonna do everything I wanna do. <laughs> and that comes with the consequence when you are not wealthy. <laughs> we wanna live a wealthy life and sometimes it takes time to get there, right? And so we just have to plan for where we wanna go. And this is my last slide. And so this is my contact information. If anyone would like to reach out to me to take advantage of one of those free financial needs analysis, if you have any additional questions that um, have not been answered in this setting, please feel free to reach out to me. I didn't have enough time to go through everything, but I'm, I'm telling you um, that we definitely need to take control of our finances, start investing and in, in building something for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Coach Monique. Uh, we do have two questions that I want to um, post to you so you can go ahead and answer. The first question is, how do you start the process of making a plan? Yes, ma'am. And so what I can do is actually you can reach out to me and we can do that free financial plan together. Ultimately, what, what, what you would do to start that process is gathering up all of your debt, provided you have that, right? All of your income. And then I'm going to put that together for you in a plan that's going to show you how to accelerate debt, to show you how much money you need for retirement, all those things. And so you just start by just reaching out to me. That's it. <laughs> okay. And the next question says, rather than a savings account, where should we save or invest our money? That's a great question. And so I only touched on that briefly um, in the presentation, but where you would do that is a mutual fund. And I don't want to just vaguely or broadly say that across this platform because it's not the right thing for everybody, right? And so as an investment rep, it's in my best interest and your best interest for me to not just give that advice randomly. Let me just say this. With mutual funds, they have a rate of return, which is about 12%, right? And that's all I can say legally. But 12%, that's a great place for anybody who wants to get started investing. Um, but anytime we do investing, um, we have to go through something that's called suitability questions. And in those suitability questions, I'll ask you about um, your experience with investing, what are your goals for the future, and things of that nature. Because when it comes to long-term savings, you don't want to have all of your money tied up into a long-term savings vehicle when you need money to buy a house. Because when so, with, with some of those savings vehicles, if you pull out too soon, and so for example, with the mutual fund, if you pull out of that before age 59 and a half, you will be penalized by the government, right? And so you'll have to pay tax and early withdrawal fees. So it's very similar to a 401k. 
But if you have 401k at work, I would definitely recommend that you max out the 401k. So whatever the company is, is matching, you only match up, you only put it up to that amount. So if they say we're going to match up to 3% or whatever the case may be, you do three. Now you take the rest of your money that you want to invest and put it somewhere else. But that's something, again, that we can have a, a one-on-one -on -one conversation about your unique situation. And then we can talk about recommendations from there. All right. Thank you. Right. You're welcome. I think, welcome. That, I think oh, one person asked, is it safe now with the economy the way it is? I, that's a great question. And I, um, I, I really didn't touch on this in the presentation. And so when it comes to investing, what the wealthy do when the economy is lower, that's the perfect time to invest because that's when the market is on sale, right? And so just think about it. Like, for example, if Walmart is having a sale, right? And everybody's like, you know, everything is 50% off. Everybody is going to Walmart. We gonna find a way to get the Walmart. I don't care if I gotta walk. There's something there that I need. It's fifty percent off, and then now it goes to seventy five percent off. And I'm like, I have got to get this stuff because I might need this in the future. It's the same thing with the market, right? It's, so when it comes to investing, it's always best to invest when the market is lower, and that's something that can be accomplished with the mutual fund platform. One thing I can tell you is that it is impossible to time the market, and so. If you look and you say, oh man, everything is going great right now. Now you want to start investing, you're going to pay a higher price because everything is going great right now. But as the market comes down, that's when the wealthy start pouring their money and they start buying properties. They start buying real estate because everything is cheaper. And so it's the, it's the perfect opportunity now to start investing. Okay. And uh, another question says, is it true that the banking industry is, is failing? I wouldn't necessarily say that the banking industry is failing. Um, I think it's important for us to know what options we have available to us when it comes to investing and saving our money. I will say that for banks, they are FDIC insured up to 250000 so if anything happened, if you had that much money in there, they would have to compensate you, right, for that money. But anything above that, because for one, they're not giving you interest on it anyway. So that's one thing you need to keep in mind. But I wouldn't necessarily say that the banking um, industry is failing. What they are failing to do is educate us about getting wealthy. They're never going to do that because they need us to survive. And so that's how I would answer that question. Okay. Well, thank you, Coach. Beck, you have no given us a lot of information and we are very grateful and we will take what we need to take and apply it to our everyday life. So thank you Amen. so much. No problem.